name of this course is theory of computation. And let us spend a little time to understand the scope of this course. Now, we have uh, the word computation in the title and it is saying that our course is about the theory of this entity called computation. Now, when we talk of computation today, clearly what we understand as computation is that you write some programs and you run the programs and computers and then in that way you carry out a computation. So, fundamental activity behind computation or the way computation is carried out by executing programs. So, what are programs? Let me let me write this term, which we are all familiar with. Programs, and uh, in a way, we can say that our theory is about programs. Right? But there can be various theories. I need to now say clearly, specifically, what we mean by our theory that we'll discuss here. But again, if we think of the word program, we know there is something fundamental behind this term, even more fundamental, because after all a program is nothing but nothing but an algorithm expressed in a programming language. So, we can say programs express algorithm. And you see, already we are making an abstraction in this that we are saying that programs express algorithms. So, more fundamental notion than program is the notion of an algorithm. So, going back again, what we can say that our theory is about theory of algorithms right theory of computation theory of programs theory of algorithms all more or less denote the same thing in our context what are algorithms for we all know that but let us let us let us enunciate clearly we know that algorithm what it does is it computes or it gives us a recipe for computing an input output mapping. So, let us again write this an algorithm is a recipe for carrying out input to output transformation. Okay. This seems obvious enough that when I have a program, it is executing an algorithm and what is that algorithm? That algorithm is a finite effective step by step process or description of a process, which we are calling a recipe more familiar term for carrying out a transformation of the given input to an output. Another way of saying this would be that an algorithm tells us how to, how to compute a function. So, you see if I write like this a recipe for carrying out input to output transformation. So, in picture it will be like this is an algorithm and as we know that it tells me for a given input how to get its output. 
but then we can see this as telling me what is the output for let us say the input x. If I call that output, if I term that output, output for x as f of x, then we are we are dealing with an even more fundamental familiar concept is that of a function, right. So, as you know a function f is a mapping from some domain to some range and in this case the domain is the domain of all inputs and the range is the range of all outputs for a specific function, right. You may have an intuitive understanding of a function, right. You may have uh, an idea what the function should compute. In other words, given an x, what f x should be, but that is not enough for actually obtaining given an x the value f x. For that, what we say is that we have to give an algorithm to compute that function f. So, we can say that an algorithm computes a function, again that is kind of very straightforward, simple understanding, right. Every algorithm computes a function, right. So, let us write this here, every algorithm computes or I should have said tells us how to compute a function. The distinction should be clear between algorithm and function we all understand. Function is an abstract notion which tells me that here is this mapping between input and output, domain and range and algorithm is telling me how to obtain the output for a specific input, right. In other words, we are using the word computes in that sense. Now, I can say basic, basic goal of our theory is to figure out for what functions we can have algorithms. Now, that might sound a little unfamiliar. We may think that if we can dream of a function, if we can define a function, if we can in some way tell somebody else about a function, then that itself should be an algorithm, but really that is not the case. For example, let me let me provide a very simple uh, illustration. Consider this function which is e is prime, right. This takes a number. So, let us say, so my domain is the set of numbers and the range is E s or no. And by that what I mean is, supposing I say is prime and then apply it on a number, then it is going to be the output is going to be or the answer the value of this function on the on the argument n is going to be either e s or no. And now, let me define when I want the answer to be yes and when I want the answer to be no. So, let us say it should be yes if n is a prime, the number n you have given as argument is a prime and it should be no if n is not a prime. So, you have defined this function, 
but you see clearly we are not saying this definition itself is not telling me given an n how to actually come up with the answer and the right answer. And that would be as you know and you have surely written a program to compute this function, you will have to give an algorithm which will tell me how to given an argument n which is a number n, how to figure out whether it is a prime or not. And that how to should be expressed in terms of simple operations which can be carried out on a computer. Right? So, these are all we know. In other words, we would like to write a program to compute this function. So, you see that underlying that program, that algorithm is computing a function. So, coming back what we what we are trying to say that it may be possible to define a function, but the definition of the function does not immediately point out in all cases to an algorithm to compute that function. If that is the case, then at least you can now see that there is a possibility that I may be able to define a function, I may be able to describe what the output should be without having an idea how to obtain the correct answer. Although we have not possibly encountered such situations in our programming experience, but it might surprise you when I tell you that actually it is a fact that for most functions there are no algorithms to compute. In other words, if you think of the class of all functions, then only a tiny um, fraction, only a tiny subset of these functions admit algorithms to compute them. And this is something which we will be able to prove, which we will be able to demonstrate in our theory. So, in other words, let me say a primary goal of our theory is going to be to figure out which functions can admit or will admit algorithms to compute them. The basic goal of our course that we are going to go through in this series of lectures may say as it is to identify the class of functions which admit algorithms to compute them. So, what we are saying is that there are some functions which are of the kind that for function f there is an algorithm. to compute f right. And there are some other functions rest do not admit any algorithms to compute them. So, in this class of functions that if you give me an input a, then I will be able to tell you by carrying out by computing the corresponding algorithm for f, what the value of the function will be on the argument a, whatever be the argument. But in this case, it may be that for some inputs I will be able to give but there may be inputs for which I will not be able to tell you what the output is. In other words, I will not have an algorithm in general to compute that function. And as I said that 
most of the functions unfortunately if you like they fall in this class that they do not admit any algorithm to compute them. So, at the end of the course in principle you should be able to not only have examples which are very clear and which are uh, in a way uh, important of functions for which we will not have any algorithms. So, we should be able to prove that such is the case with those functions. And in principle or again we will have the knowledge of the techniques to demonstrate that a function does not admit any algorithm to compute. And that as I said is going to be at the very end of this course. Now, the way we look at this problem, although this is the fundamental thing, this is our basic goal is to identify the class of functions which admit algorithms to compute them, but you will see in the course actually we will not talk about functions. Instead, we will talk about a problem which is kind of related and I will have to show you the relation and that problem is called the membership question, the, you know given a set and given an element whether an ele that element is a member of that set. Okay. So, this is the question that will engage us for most of the course and let me clearly explain what that question is. So, let me understand, let us understand what this problem is set membership problem. It is actually very simple to state, it is a very general problem that you know you have some set S. And our problem is that given any A as input to decide if A is a member is an element of the set S. Okay. So, very simple right. There is a set in some way we understand what is that set and now you give me some element A and we would like to know whether this element belongs to the set S or not. Now, as I said all the time in this course, we will really be talking about this problem. What we will do is, we will be able to show various kinds of algorithms, not the way you study in uh, algorithms course, but through various models of computation the classes of set for which we can carry out this problem. Now, what is the connection between set membership problem and the basic goal that I had talked of here. You see if you think of a function f, then remember that we said that uh, function f notationally we always write like this that a function f is a mapping from some domain to some range r. Now, you might know that there is a very natural set which is associated with any function and that is that set is called the graph of f. Right. And that graph of f is a set and what is that set? That set is a set of tuples a b such that f of a 
is equal to b. Okay. Now, the point is this that with every function f, the you can associate such a graph and now suppose we cannot decide we cannot give an algorithm to compute or to carry out or to solve the set membership problem of graph of x. So, let us write it down. Suppose we show that there is no algorithm to solve the set membership problem for the set graph of Remember, this is a set, and as we said, this is this particular set is defined like this. Suppose we show that there is no algorithm to solve the set membership problem for the set graph of x. Then we can conclude that there will there is no algorithm to compute f also that there is no algorithm to compute f so what i'm saying is that if we show that there is no algorithm to solve the set membership problem of graph f, then there is no algorithm to compute the function f itself. And this is quite easy to see and uh, we can very easily prove the equivalent contrapositive statement and which will say that if there is an algorithm to compute f, then there is an algorithm to solve set membership problem of graph f. So, if you have an algorithm to compute f, right, then if somebody gives you this tuple a b, now and you have an algorithm to compute f, then what you can do is look at the first argument and compute f of a using the algorithm for computing f. So, let me let me write this. Suppose there is an algorithm to compute f then for a b given as input we compute f a using the algorithm for computing f, right. Somebody has given you the algorithm to compute f. So, you use that algorithm to compute f of a. So, a is what the first argument of this tuple. And now, supposing b is f of a, then of course, a b, 
this implies actually b equal to f of a if and only if a b is a member of graph of a right. So, therefore, using the algorithm for computing f I can solve the set membership problem. The set membership problem was given a b check whether this tuple is a member of graph of f. This tuple is going to be a member of graph of f if and only if f a is equal to b. And now, I have an algorithm to compute f and therefore, clearly give I take the first argument I compute f of a check whether b is equal to f of a and then I can answer whether a b is a member of the set graph of f. So, therefore, this statement we have proved it is so easy right. Now, if I can show therefore, that there is no algorithm for computing for there is no algorithm to solve the set membership problem of graph f, then I have shown that there is no algorithm to compute f. And this is the reason you see that a function which is not computable, we will be able to get to that fact by looking at the graph of that function and proving that graph of f is something is a kind of set is a set for which I have no algorithm to solve the set membership problem. Now, what, what does it buy? You know instead of functions then I can talk only about sets and sets are more fundamental and in a way simpler objects. And therefore, the theory at least notationally becomes simpler, although it manages to show the existence of functions, which for which we have no algorithms to compute those functions through the study of you know some kind of sets. And this is the reason most of the in, in fact entire course will concentrate on sets and their membership problem rather than functions. In fact, although that is the basic goal in our mind, because we would like to talk about programs and whether or not we can have a program to compute certain things. You will see in fact, that this problem is not something we tackle in its in, in its generality. What I mean is that the kind of sets for which we will consider set membership problem, these sets are going to be very, very special kinds of sets. And what are the sets for which we will consider set membership problem? See, these sets are, so let me write it, our sets are going to be sets of finite strings. Okay. So, let me explain these terms and to talk of strings, I need to first talk of alphabet and to talk of alphabet, I need to talk of symbols. Now, so, let me first use the term symbol. So, what is a symbol? We are not going to define it. Some only thing we, we would like to say about symbols that they are as you know them. For example, 0, 1 these are symbols right. Similarly, A, B these are symbols. And what another term that we are going to use is called alphabet. So, an alphabet is 
is a finite set of symbols. As an example, this is an alphabet. Right? There are two symbols 0 and 1. The set comprising of these two symbols is an alphabet. Also, another example could be A, B, C, D, all the way through Z. And you can, of course, give many other examples of finite sets which are made up of or which comprise of symbols. Okay. And now, let us just consider this set A, B, C. So, this is an alphabet, because this consists of, it has three members, three symbols A, B, C. And again, another familiar term is a string over these symbols. So, what is a string? String is we just write an ordered way, we write these symbols one after another up to some point. So, let us say B A A B C. This is a string over this alphabet. So, we can we can we can formally define all this more carefully, but this notion is so simple, you get it immediately that this is a string in which the first symbol is B, second symbol is A. So, there is a notion of ordering. We can talk of first, second, third, fourth, fifth and also there is a notion of length, because this has you can see the its length is 5, because it has 5 symbols. right? And uh, this is also a finite string. There could have been infinite strings over the same alphabet, but we will restrict ourselves to finite strings over an alphabet. Now, suppose sigma is an alphabet, then sigma star denotes the set of all finite strings over sigma. Okay. Now, supposing my sigma is 0 1, suppose as example I take sigma is 0 1. Then, what is sigma star? It is not difficult to see. So, what are the strings over this alphabet? They are going to be binary strings. And we said sigma star denotes the set of all finite strings over sigma and this is the binary alphabet. So, therefore, sigma star in this case is going to be the set of all finite binary strings. So, as we are saying that consider the binary alphabet which consists of just two symbols 0 and 1. In that case, the sigma star is going to be the set of all finite binary strings. Right? By this, what do I mean the finite binary strings? You know, we do not allow in sigma star to have an infinitely long string, but all strings whose lengths are finite, they will be members of sigma star and those are the finite binary strings. So, there is really no upper bound on the length of strings which we have in sigma star, but at the same time every string, any particular string that we take in sigma star that has a finite length. Is 
this notion clear? That this is an infinite set, and all its members are, you know, have finite lengths, like like set of numbers, set of integers. Right? That is an infinite set. Each integer itself is some kind of a finite object. It is, let us say, ten thousand. Could be one billion. It could be a trillion. So the num number can be arbitrarily large. Similarly, here the strings can be arbitrarily large, but each string in sigma star is finite. Right. So, now there is one very, very important notion that we are going to introduce and that notion is that of a formal language. A formal language L over the alphabet sigma is a subset of sigma star. Okay. This is a formal language L over the alphabet sigma is a subset of sigma. So, sigma star recall that it has the set of all binary by binary strings over the alphabet sigma and you take some of them possibly an infinite infinitely many of them leaving maybe some out and that constitutes a formal language over the alphabet sigma. So, it is clear that for this alphabet for sigma is again binary alphabet 0 1 1 1 0 0 1 0 1 1 1 0 1 0 1 1 0 1 0 right. This is a set of strings over the alphabet 0 1 and clearly this is a subset of this set sigma star. So, this is a language. So, we can say that this is an example of a binary language, because it all its strings are over the symbol 0 1. And this is of course, a finite language, but more interesting would be the example let us say L 1 let us say x is in 0 1. This is an alphabet. Now, I am putting the star over it. So, I mean x is a binary string such that x has even number of zeros and even number of How many such strings are there? Clearly, infinitely many. At the same time, not all binary strings are in this language L1. So, L1 is an example of a language over 0 1, which is infinite, right, but which is not the entire sigma star. So, this language L1 is a proper subset of, so you can write like this is a proper subset of sigma star. So, we have introduced a number of terms, so let me just enumerate them and briefly explain once more what each are, each of these uh, symbols is. So, we first of all uh, we talked of symbols. Then we talked of alphabet, right. Then we talked of strings over an alphabet.
then we talk to sigma star for alphabet sigma and finally, we talk to a formal language over sigma. So, very quickly symbols are like 0, 1, these are symbols. Alphabet is set of symbols. So, this is an alphabet, string over an alphabet, over this alphabet 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, this is a string, right. Sigma star over this alphabet is the set of all finite binary strings. and a formal language over this alphabet is just a subset of sigma star. L is a subset of for this particular alphabet 0 1. So, therefore, L such a formal language is also a set which, which uh, has a number of finite strings in general over the alphabet that we are dealing with. In this case, in this example at least that alphabet was a, the binary alphabet. Now, the connection with what we were saying before is this that we shall be concerned with the set membership problem of formal languages. So, now therefore, our problem is going to be somebody has some formal language L in mind and the problem therefore, is very concrete. They give me a string and I have to determine whether that string is, is a member of a formal language. Now, very briefly although we had said in terms of the graph of a function is can be seen as a set, but then what is the justification of talking about or restricting ourselves only to set membership problems of languages. And that is because the idea is really very simple. You see, when you write a program, right, then that program takes some input and that input is, is what? Is actually a string because that input you have, you need to key it in through uh, the keyboard or maybe it is coming through a file or whatever it is you can think of that input to be a string over some alphabet and the output is again in general is of course not yes or no as in the set membership problem but here we appeal to what we said earlier because our our uh, goal is to show that something cannot be done by programs and uh, so if that is a function then if we can show that the corresponding graph which is going to be in this case going to be uh, basically strings you know basically graphs those graphs of those functions that we are interested in since our inputs are going to be strings outputs are going to be strings so, these are going to be pairs of strings, pairs of strings themselves can be seen as a string and therefore, it is really a set membership problem, where the sets are really sets of strings and these strings are finite strings, right. I mean you never or it does not make sense to say that my in 
input is a string which is infinitely long, because such a input you can never even provide to the program completely for that program, your program to work on that input. So, inputs are always finite and in fact, they are always finite strings in the programming context. So, therefore, this restriction is not uh, something which is very restrictive, right? Although it seems a great restriction, you see, from functions we are coming to set membership, and then again we are saying that we are not interested in all kinds of sets, but only sets which are just sets of strings over finite alphabet. Now, that really is the basic issue in this course that you know ultimately of course, we will be talking about you know this question of whether certain set membership problem admits an algorithm or not, but we will come to we will come to that goal in a series of uh, steps if you like. So, what we are going to do is we are going to do uh, we are going to invert the problem in some sense. We will think in terms of models of computation. Let me write this term. And that means, some abstract way we are saying, we will, will describe a class of algorithms. Okay. And the that abstract way in fact, going to be by specifying what are called automata. See, these are again terms which will be much clearer when we see really examples of and we deal with them. So, our models of computations, let me just say this for the time being are automata of various kinds. So, it will define a class of automata and then will ask the question, what kinds of set membership problem this class of automata can solve. The, the kinds of automata that we are going to see, we will start with a very simple class of automata. They are called finite state automata. Now, even here there will be various kinds you will see later, uh, uh, deterministic, non deterministic and then we will study what kinds of languages for which this model of computation can solve their set membership problem after which and this is this is going to take at least uh, you know 15, 20 lectures and then we will talk about in terms of automata that is going to be push down automata. And again uh, we will study the classes of languages for which push down automata will be adequate to solve their membership problems. And then finally, we will look at the most general class of automata which is possible and you might have heard of this term, they are called Turing machines. And as we go along, there will be many other things you know we will study and for example, we will study the notion of grammars.
and here we will study a regular grammar, context free grammar, and we will briefly mention what are context sensitive grammar and then finally, the you know unrestricted grammar and there will be uh, some correspondence with these things that we are going to study. And uh, it is at this point, so as I said at the almost when we come to the end of the course or in the last part of the course, we are going to encounter set membership problems for which there will be no algorithms to solve. We will stop here and in the next lecture onwards, we will start with finite state automata first and we will we'll be dealing with them for quite some time.